Hello, and welcome to Packaging Design for Sterilization. My name is Andrew Manrique, and I am the Packaging Engineer and Study Director for Nelson Laboratories. Prior to working in the medical industry, I worked in the consumer goods industry and the custom packaging industry. Much of my previous experience comes from creating unique packaging solutions for military, aerospace, museum, automobile industry, and so on. However, here at Nelson Laboratories, I've gained a great amount of training and insight into the medical device world. And I'm happy to share my experience and to help you better understand sterilization methods and how to design around them. Let me start here by saying that this webinar is not intended for someone who is brand new to the world of packaging and sterilization. Rather, it is intended for use in actual packaging design and may be more used to those who are a little bit more well-versed in the packaging subject. Okay. Let's briefly go over the agenda. We're going to cover the three most common types of sterilization found in the medical device field. We're going to cover what the sterilization method is, how it works, the variables that affect it, and then how to design around those variables. We'll begin with ethylene oxide, followed by ionizing radiation, otherwise known as gamma or electron beam. And finally, we're gonna talk about steam or otherwise known as wet heat. The first thing that really needs to be taken into consideration when designing for packaging is the actual product itself. While the product and package ideally work together, generally the product exists in some shape or form before the packaging is considered. The sterilization method will then be chosen for the product and then the product will help to facilitate the sterilization. While there are many types of sterilization to choose from, not all methods are suitable for all types of product. For example, steam sterilization is an extremely effective method and may work wonderfully on stainless steel surgical instruments. However, if you had a device with soft surgical tubing, the extreme heat would most likely destroy your device. Generally speaking, the physical properties of the medical device in question dictate the sterilization methods. For example, if you have long lumens or difficult to reach places, ionizing radiation may be optimal, and that could be gamma, x-ray, or e-beam. Um, if the devices are particularly dense or have sensitive electronic components, however, ionizing radiation may not be your best option. In this case, perhaps ethylene oxide or vaporized hydrogen peroxide is optimal. Whatever option you choose, the designer needs to understand both how each process works and what variables can be manipulated to optimize the packaging. Once we best understand which method of sterilization we will be using, we can move on to the packaging design. So to begin, here's a brief list of the most common types of sterilization. I have generally sorted them from uh, most to least prevalent. Uh, ethylene oxide accounts for greater than half of sterilization, followed by gamma radiation and electron beam, and finally steam. Uh, VHP or vaporized hydrogen peroxide is also common, but less so than the others. Dry heat is generally used for terminal sterilization of products, and so we're not gonna go into too much detail on that. We will go into further detail on EO, ionizing radiation and steam, as well as what the designer needs to take into account for a successful design. Now, there are many types of sterilization out there, including ozone, parasitic acid, UV light, and so on. However, they're not as commonly seen in the industry, and so we're going to omit them in the interest of delivering the most relevant information possible at the time that we do have. Okay, so let's jump into the discussion on ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide is the most common sterilization method in the medical industry. Over half of all medical devices tested use this method. For those of you who are not familiar with the chemical, it is actually a colorless and extremely flammable gas, um, which is primarily used as a precursor in manufacturing uh, for products such as ethylene glycol, which you might know as antifreeze, and various other plastics or polymers and actually less than 1% of all EO that's manufactured is used for sterilization. The EO sterilization cycle involves placing items into a chamber where the humidity and EO gas are introduced. The, heat, the humidity is actually a very important part of the process in that without it, the sterilization kill mechanism could not occur. Now, after a predetermined amount of time has passed, the gas is flushed from the chamber and the items are allowed to off-gas in order to ensure that most of the EO residual has been removed. Okay, so let's talk about a few of the advantages and disadvantages along with the EO process in order to better understand the variables which have to be taken into consideration for proper design. One of the great advantages of EO sterilization is that the temperatures experienced by the product are very low when compared with steam or dry heat. Typically, this falls around 52 degrees Celsius. 
Now, this is a great this is great for medical devices, which have, uh, for example, heat sensitive polymers, sensors, and so on. It's also advantageous for the packaging designer because a lot of packaging materials do degrade under high heat. For example, many polymers melt, medical grade papers tend to discolor and even become brittle. Therefore, the, many of the advantages that exist for the medical device also exist for the packaging as well. Another advantage of EO sterilization is uh, its high penetration. Some form of sterilization such as uh, electron beam or UV light require line of sight in order to get the proper sterilization effects. EO molecules are quite small and as such actually get, or they have great penetrate, penetrating effects into difficult to reach areas such as lumens. EO may be a great choice if your product has a bunch of small crevices, blind holes, or other uh, difficult to reach features. But as you can imagine, there are limitations. EO will not be able to reach areas which are completely sealed or even have very long lengths of tubing because the gas needs to be able to penetrate into those areas. Next, we have low humidity. Well, I did say that humidity is necessary. It is not a very high humidity when compared to steam. Um, this is good for packaging materials that degrade such as paper and may become uh, a little bit less tenuous in the presence of high humidity. So this is a good, a good ad advantage. Okay, so let's go over a few of the disadvantages common to EO sterilization. First, we have long processing times. Before items can be successfully processed, they need to go what's undergo what's called a preconditioning stage. Um, this is because in order for the EO gas to be effective, the products need to be warmed and humidified to a stable inter internal temperature and humidity. This is usually done in a purpose-built room rather than the EO chamber itself. This means that while the process is still considered a dry process, there is in fact some humidity involved. Um, the length of this process is dependent on how long it takes for the temperature and humidity to stabilize. Okay, so therefore the packaging designer needs to take into consideration how dense the pallet loads are. Obviously, the more dense your pallet, the longer it will take to reach a steady state condition. Too light a pallet load and you're able to fit less product into each sterilization load, and so your overall price is going to increase as more loads are necessary. This is all about balancing your options. Another thing to keep in mind is that EO is extremely uh, flammable and carcinogenic. Because of the carcinogenic qualities, long aeration times are required to ensure that all EO gas has been removed from the product post-processing. This generally adds several days to the overall process. The actual exposure times aren't really that long, but the preconditioning and aeration stages mean that the overall process does last quite a while. Generally, you can expect to see about 24 hours of preconditioning, 18, or I'm sorry, eight to 20 hours of overall exposure, and about 24 to uh, 72 hours of aeration. So this gives you a total time of around three to five days. A few other disadvantages um, to EO are the possible residuals. Um, residuals are gonna be byproducts of the processing that are left over after the off-gassing cycle is finished. Uh, the three main ethylene oxide residuals are EO itself, uh, ethylene oxide itself, um, which may remain after processing is completed. Then we have ethylene chlorohydrin, or ECH, and this is the residue that is formed when EO comes into contact with free chloride items. And last but not least, we had mentioned ethylene glycol before, and this is what happens when EO comes into contact with water. Now, as an interesting aside, after the ethylene oxide is actually evacuated from the chamber when the cycle is finished, the excess EO is actually pumped into a large chamber that contains water and high humidity. And this essentially turns the EO residual into ethylene glycol, which is then recycled and used in other industrial processes. Here on this slide, we have a quick overview of the process that is undergone by the EO chamber itself. As you can see, the first thing that happens is the product is uh, under ambient atmospheric pressure, and then that's dramatically decreased. This could be a potential issue if your product or your package has a high sensitivity to the large pressure change. Features that might be affected by this would be sealed portions of the product, which do not allow for the release of pressure. These large pressure drops also happen at the end of the cycle where we're trying to purge the EO gas and replace it with an inert gas such as nitrogen. 
This is also, or this is also where you need to take into account the load configuration, the volume, the density, and the overall configuration of the load and pallet uh, and its impact for the ability of gas to be removed after processing. And we're gonna discuss a little bit more on that later on. So now that we know a little bit more about the EO sterilization process, we can talk about some of the design considerations and recommendations. One of the primary considerations for EO sterilization with respect to packaging is the porosity or the breathability of the material used. EO is what is known in the industry as a gas in, gas out process. And this means that to be effective, the packaging needs to let EO into the package and post-processing, it needs to allow the EO to dissipate. This means that more porosity is better. As breathability increases, cycle and aeration times are going to be reduced. One of the common tests used to desert, determine porosity of a material is through the use of what's known as a densometer. Often, uh, the densometer is called the Gurley test because one of the most well-known manufacturers of densometers is Gurley Precision Instruments. What the densometer does is it has a cylinder with graduated markings on it. The cylinder is pulled upward to a predetermined height and a sample is placed in the sample holder. As the cylinder is let go, it displaces air through the sample. Therefore, the more porous your material is, the more quickly the cylinder is going to fall. A non-material or a non-porous material, for example, will not allow the passage of air and will not allow the a cylinder to move at all. Theoretical calculations for porous area require knowledge of a few key characteristics. First, we're gonna to need to take into account the breathable surface area or how much of the package is comprised of porous material, then the total package volume, and finally, the secondary and tertiary packaging, which we're gonna discuss on the next slide. It's also worth noting that vaporized hydrogen peroxide is very similar to EO in that it is a gas-based sterilization method. Because of this, all the discussion on porosity and breathability which apply to EO would also apply to VHP. Okay, so speaking of the secondary and tertiary packaging, another factor to take into consideration is the overall packaging scheme. While you may have very breathable primary packaging, the breathability goes down as it's loaded into master packs and to pallet loads, for example. Corrugated fiberboard, otherwise known as cardboard, is quite breathable, but you can imagine that once you have a whole bunch of products loaded into the outer box, and then these boxes are further loaded into a pallet, the EO gas now has to go quite a distance in order to effectively sterilize the very center of the pallet. In many industries, uh, plastic wrap is used in order to sterilize the pallet, but, or I'm sorry, to stabilize the pallet and unitize it. But as you can imagine, uh, plastic wrap greatly inhibits the breathability of the pallet load. Because of this, there are some special unitization techniques which can help with this situation. For example, there are stretch wraps which are created out of more net-like materials. The spacing between the polymer strands allows for the EO gas to pass freely into and out of the pallet load. Another option to consider is the use of um, corner posts and banding in order to restrain the pallet configuration. This may not always be a great option, for example, if you have a large number of smaller packages, but it is still something to consider and it is an option. Okay, let's take a look at some of the more common styles of packaging that are available to uh, the designer. There are other options, however, these are some of the most common ones uh, for off-the-shelf solutions. One thing that they, that they will um, obviously have in common is the use of spun-bound HDPE or medical grade paper. A good uh, example of spun-bound HDPE in industry is Tyvek. Um, essentially anything that is going to act as a good filter material, but not allow the, or a good, good filter material, but allow the passage of VO gas into and out of the package is going to be fantastic. The photo above shows a very common style of pouch that is used for many devices. As you remember, we previously spoke about the ratio of breathable to non-breathable material, or breathable material to total package volume. These pouches are half porous material and half non-porous material, giving them a very good ratio of breathability. One of the common failures I see with packaging styles like this is that the pouch is actually stuffed into a master pack and the spun bound HDPE gets folded and wrinkled. And while this may not cause a breach of the sterile barrier, it will cause failures in your bubble emission testing and this could throw a wrench into your validation. Remember, when using pouches like this, um, always, avoid, always avoid crunching, wrinkling, or otherwise mechanically stressing the spun bound HDP as much as possible. 
Here is another example of a spun bound HDPE uh, known as header bags. The header bags use a strip of the HDPE at the top to allow for breathability. Now, these are great for the devices which require a seal against moisture. Essentially, the HDPE portion is present during the sterilization process. Then after sterilization, the pouch is sealed right below the spun bound HDPE header, creating a non-porous, non-breathable pouch. Essentially, this is the best of both worlds in that porous and non-porous packaging are together and result in a non-porous packaging that is resistant to moisture. One should note, however, that the ratio of breathable material to non-breathable material is not as great as the traditional pouches seen on the previous slide. This means that your overall cycle time and off-gassing times are going to be longer, so something to take into consideration there. Finally, here is another very common style of breathable tray. Again, using spun-bound HDPE or medical grade paper, um, these are used to constrain heavier, heavier, bulkier, or perhaps odd-shaped items. Um, this is also a good design option uh, if you have sharp or pointy features that would more, more easily puncture a pouch. The tray can be formed to snugly restrain the medical device, uh, while the filter pr uh, material provides very good breathability. So another packaging style to keep in mind. One last thing to remember, sometimes sterilization cycles fail. As one of our EO consultants once told me, it is not a matter of if this is gonna happen, but when it's gonna happen. With this in mind, it is of the utmost importance to design and validate packaging and product, which can handle twice the exposure to EO as necessary. The reason being that if the first cycle fails, there must be a validation in place showing that it is acceptable to re-sterilize the product. If this is not in place, the entire load of product must be thrown away, and this could equate to a huge sum of money. The, this hint isn't only true for EO sterilization, but actually for all forms of sterilization. Remember, cycles do fail every now and again, and we need to be prepared for this eventuality. So, in summary, we know that EO has great compatibility with most materials. It does not react with or degrade most materials out there. It does, however, have long processing times. There are things that we can do to mitigate this issue, such as increasing breathability of the packaging and taking into consideration load configurations on pallets. Again, this is a gas in, gas out process and breathability is paramount. Next, let's take a look at the most common, the next most common form of sterilization is ionizing radiation. Now, ionizing radiation is known as any type of radiation which can free electrons from atoms or molecules, thereby causing ionization. At high enough levels, all forms of ionizing radiation can sterilize objects. However, some forms are more common than others, these being gamma and electron beam. The process used for this type of sterilization is actually pretty straightforward and simple. The package is loaded into special carts which ride a large conveyor system. The system takes the product into a shielded room where it is exposed to the ionizing radiation source. In the case of gamma, the source is typically rods of cobalt-60. These are kept in a protective water bath and then raised and lowered in order to activate or deactivate the sterilization process. The product is exposed to a validated dose and then is conveyed out of the radiation chamber completing the sterilization. In the case of electron beam, um, the source of ionizing radiation is much different, even though the basic process is pretty much the same. Rather than using a radioactive material, electrons are generated into a tight beam, and then they're accelerated through an electric field and swept back and forth across the product. If you remember back to the good old days when we had tube TVs instead of the flat screen TVs we do today, um, these, uh, these tube TVs are called cathode ray tubes, or CRTs, and they're actually a very small version of the exact same machine as the electron beam. The only difference is that the electrons from these uh, were turned into visible light through the use of phosphorus screens rather than being aimed at a medical device for sterilization. Now let's take a look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of ionizing radiation. One of the primary considerations is that ionizing radiation has very little temperature effects on materials. This makes it much more compatible, uh, much more compatible with material polymers that have high heat, uh, high stresses in sterilization. If you have a device which is very sensitive to heat, this is definitely going to be a good option for you. Also, because there are no chemicals involved, there are no residues to worry about in the traditional sense. 
However, since ionizing radiation can alter materials on the molecular level, it is possible that chain scission or cutting of the molecules could modify the material. We're going to talk a little bit more about chain scission and the various changes that can occur a little bit later in the presentation. Finally, another great advantage to ionizing radiation is that there is no need for porous materials in the packaging. Because the electrons or the gamma waves can pass through the material of the packaging very easily, there is no need for breathability. This can lower packaging material price. And it also means that if you have a product that is constrained in a glass vial, for example, or is sensitive to moisture, the packaging can easily as act as a moisture barrier and you can still have easy sterilization. Now let's take a look at a few of the disadvantages of ionizing radiation. First and foremost, gamma fundamentally changes the molecular structure of many thermoplastics, resins, thermosets, and so on. This can often cause issues such as discoloration and changes to the material properties. Sometimes this can in brittle materials. And then brittle materials will have a tougher time with mechanical tests such as shock, vibration, drop tests, and so on. However, there are definitely plastics which are more impervious to radiation, and there are even additives which you can add to protect the plastic. There also can be um, optical changes to the materials. Um, these can be changes in your gloss or your haze or your color. And while these may be somewhat aesthetically annoying, this could still be a potential issue for some manufacturers. And so it's still something to take into consideration. Sometimes after a period of time has passed, the color change will go back to its original appearance, um, but research needs to be done in order to know exactly what to expect from your materials. Another consideration is that a series of product cartons will be loaded into an aluminum container, which is also known as a tote or a carrier, which will then convey the product around the radiation source. Um, standardizing your product uh, carton sizes and densities is an effective way of offering the most economical return on your radiation process. Okay, so in this slide, we can see a pictorial example of changes that can take place on the molecular level when using ionizing radiation. Um, in the first example to the left, we can see three polymer chains that are kind of denoted in black there. Um, the polymer chains are essentially very long molecules that are common in thermoplastics. Oftentimes they are pretty much like long spaghetti strings which intertwine and tangle to create a matrix. And while they are fairly robust in this configuration, there are ways of making it even stronger. Sometimes by uh, using ionizing radiation, we can create physical connections between the polymer chains, and this is denoted in red between the black lines. We can now create a structure that is much more like a web uh, than individual strands, and this becomes very strong and generally enhances the material properties of the polymer. A much more likely scenario, however, is sizzing. In the photo off to the right, we can see a close-up of a polymer chain, or an example thereof. When the chain is subject to ionizing radiation, the particles or waves tend to break the chain into smaller pieces. If you imagine a material that is essentially a huge knot of long strings, breaking up these strings into smaller pieces will compromise the strength of the material. And this is exactly what happens with, with scission. Products that experience this generally lose a lot of their strength and become a lot more brittle. This can also uh, cause discoloration, changes in gloss, and other material property changes as well. Sometimes the changes do revert uh, back to normal, as I said, after a period of time. However, this is not the same for all materials, and you do have to kind of understand uh, how your material in particular is going to respond to these particular forms of sterilization. In this slide, uh, which I find very interesting actually, we can see two examples of physical effects that can happen to materials after exposure to ionizing radiation. The uh, figure on the left is actually a cola glass after being exposed to gamma radiation. The material beforehand was actually bright and clear like most glass that you see, and post exposure, you can see that it has a yellowing or a browning of the material. Um, this is also accompanied by mechanical changes to the material as well, and this glass would probably break a little bit more easily than one that has not been exposed. Um, again, sometimes these diminish over time, but it's still something to take into consideration. Um, to the right, you can see what is known as a Lichtenberg figure. So after a material such as acrylic in this case is exposed to an electron beam, it actually retains an internal stress caused by the highly charged particle impacts. And when the stress is released, it takes a pathway of least resistance. Um, and this is, if you notice, it's kind of a lightning-like figure. And so it's very reminiscent of a vascular system or lightning bolts or waterways. And plus they're a pretty cool decoration and conversation piece for the table. 
Okay, now let's take a look at some of the considerations for design with electron beam. When designing for electron beam, there are some things which need to be accounted for which are not necessarily there for gamma or x-ray. Electron beam differs from gamma in the ionizing radiation comes in the form of particles or electrons uh, which contain mass. Gamma rays are pure energy and they have no associated mass with them. Uh, because electrons have mass, they have a limited range in passing through materials, very important. If you imagine shooting a ton of bullets at a wall, they're going to penetrate fairly easily, but not as easily as light going through a window, for example. Because of this property of electron beams, they also have limited penetration through materials. This means that if you have a very dense material, for example, a metal knee replacement, uh, you're only going to be able to sterilize one side of the implant that is directly exposed to the electron beam. This means that the side which is not facing the electron beam will experience what is called shadowing. So shadowing is exactly as it sounds like. Um, as you stand in front of a radiation source, say for example the sun, uh, the light can't pass through you and so you create a shadow or an area where the light is obscured. Now, if that light or the sun is your source of sterilization, then the area in the shadow is not gonna be sterilized. So in order to combat this, Sometimes products go through the sterilizer more than once. Um, they're rotated after each pass to ensure that each side receives proper exposure. Now, I have heard that there are sterilization plants which have special rotating plantains in order to ensure equal exposure, although I've not seen them personally, and usually the rotation does happen manually. Even though there are a few drawbacks to the E-beam, it does have one very large advantage. The exposure times are extremely low. While gamma can be hours, uh, E-beam is generally minutes, and therefore the throughput is much higher. Now, there is a fantastic resource out there to help the designer predict and understand uh, what materials to use with various sterilization methods. And this resource is known as Technical Information Report number 17, or TIR 17, Compatibility of Materials Subject to Sterilization. Let's take a quick look at some of the information and how it is organized. Okay, so TIR-17 covers the most common methods of sterilization. It covers radiation, ethylene oxide, moist heat, otherwise known as steam, dry heat, hydrogen peroxide, and ozone. And as you can see, an example of some of the tables which can be found within the technical report is on the slide at hand. On the upper left-hand side of the table, you're going to see the material names listed in alphabetical order. These charts are actually pretty darn large as they contain a huge library of materials and their interactions with various modes of sterilization. This particular table shows how well each material responds to radiation. You can see that there are four columns. Um, to the left is the names of the materials. The first of those four columns shows a score of one up to four dots. In the table, you can see various materials pitted against each other. As you can see, for uh, as you can see the example, the very first material listed there is acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, otherwise known as ABS, because no one really wants to have to remember that name. <laughs> so you can see that ABS is uh, particularly excellent when excellent when used with hydrogen peroxide, but behaves rather poorly when subject to steam or moist heat. So obviously, four dots denotes a, uh, a rating of excellent, um, as you can see in the key at the very top, and one dot denotes uh, very poor. So this is extremely useful when choosing materials. You just kind of go on there like you're looking through a phone book or a dictionary, and you choose your material and do a little bit of research into how it's going to react. Okay, when designing for ionizing radiation, we take a very similar approach to ethylene oxide in that we need to take our dose with its associated st uh, a sterility assurance level, and we need to double this as a worst case scenario for the validation. This is because once again, we are not guaranteed that every sterilization cycle is gonna run perfectly. If we have a failure, we need to be certain that the packaging and the product are able to withstand the second sterilization run without destroying the sterile barrier properties of the for the given shelf life. So always keep that in mind. Okay, so let's take a look at a few of the key features and things to take home when talking about ionizing radiation. First, ionizing radiation changes materials on the molecular level. Many times these changes can adversely affect anything exposed to the radiation. It's great if we can predict the severity of these changes ahead of time, and a great tool for doing this is the Technical Information Report number 17, or TIR 17. 
ionizing radiation is also a low temperature operation, and products which are particularly heat sensitive may be well suited to this method. And when compared to ethylene oxide, the cycle times for ionization radiation are very low, even more so for electron beam, which uh, only takes a couple min minutes as uh, previously mentioned. And last but not least, ionizing radiation is compatible with a very wide selection of packaging styles and materials, both porous and non-porous. Next, let's talk about the most prevalent method uh, we have, which is uh, wet heat, otherwise known as steam sterilization. Steam sterilization works by two mechanisms, denaturation and lysis. Uh, denaturation is a process of modifying the molecular structure of a protein. Um, it involves breaking many of the weak linkages or bonds within a protein molecule that are responsible for the highly ordered structure of the protein at its natural state. And lysis is the disintegration of a cell by a rupture of its cell wall or membrane. Essentially, the moist heat or the steam itself coming into contact with the microorganism activates the kill mechanism. Wet steam, um, what, or I'm sorry, wet heat or steam with vapor is still present um, and contains a very large amount of latent heat energy is what it's called. Um, so for example, to bring one gallon of water from 23 degrees Celsius, which is about ambient or room temperature, up to 100 degrees Celsius requires about 180 BTUs of energy. And BTUs stands for British Thermal Unit and is a measure of heat energy. Um, but to bring the same amount of water from 100 degrees Celsius into steam uh, requires 971 BTUs. So that's 180 to get it up to 100. And to turn it into steam over 100 requires 971. When that steam turns back into water again from contact with the medical device, it releases that 971 BTUs back into the device, destroying the bacteria. So this is obviously quite a bit of energy that's transferred through the phase transition of steam into water and water into steam. The fact that steam also acts like a gas means that it also requires porous packaging materials uh, such as spun bound HDPE and fabrics. This means that the design of medical packaging should be done similarly to the assumptions that were made with EO. High porosity and high heat resistant materials are absolutely necessary. A beneficial aspect of steam is the fact that water is easily available in almost any location and it's inexpensive to produce into steam. Now this is much different from EO gas, which is extremely dangerous and requires a lot of precautions for its shipping and distribution. The isotopes like cobalt-60 for gamma radiation are also very, very dangerous and are consumable over time and so they do need to re be replaced every so often. Another big advantage to steam is that there is no need for lengthy preconditioning stages and the exposure stage is fairly short and there is no off-gassing stage as there is with EO. This means that the overall cycle time is greatly reduced. Another great advantage to steam is that it can be used in an inline manufacturing process. And by this that I mean that large batches of product do not need to be sent to a sterilizer, but it can actually be incorporated, incorporated into the manufacturing line itself. And so as each product is produced, packaged, sterilized, and then placed into its tertiary packaging, all as one inline mechanical process. And lastly, being that steam is essentially a phase transformed version of water, there should be absolutely no toxicity concerns. There's not gonna be any residues and there's not gonna be any off-gassing needs. So moving on to the disadvantages of steam. One of the primary disadvantages is the very dangerous nature of steam. Steam uh, causes a rapid rise in pressure in an autoclave, creating a risk of explosion. And even though we do have uh, safety measures inherently built into the systems, there's always the risk of failure. Um, another potential disadvantage is uh, the incomplete elimination of air from the sterilizer. So since the kill mechanism depends on steam being phase shifted back into water, steam must actually come into contact with the medical device itself. So if the chamber does not completely evacuate all necessary air, this process is not gonna happen and you may not have complete sterilization. Now on the other side of this coin is superheated steam. When you have steam that's too hot, it's not gonna phase shift from steam back into the water stage, and you may end up again with incomplete sterilization. 
Another disadvantage is its incompatibility with some materials, especially sensitive electronics, plastics that could potentially melt or warp, and so on. Again, check TIR 17 for more information on compatibility. Let's look at a few of the design notes and takeaways associated with steam sterilization. First off, in order for the kill mechanism to take place, the steam must come into contact with the medical device and condense into water once again, releasing the latent energy. Because of this, porous material is ne necessary and essential. For the same reason that we need a good ratio of porous material to non-porous material in the ethylene oxide method, we also have the same requirements for steam sterilization. The more your packaging, uh, the more porous your packaging, the more opportunity steam has to penetrate. Uh, this next one is a bit of a no-brainer, but it needs to be said nonetheless. The materials you're selecting for the packaging must be compatible with high heat. Um, we typically see about 121 to 132 degrees Celsius for humidity and moisture. And last but not least, always design for double sterilization in case you have a failure and you need to re-sterilize. This is just the same as it was for each other mode, and it's something that always needs to be taken into consideration. Okay, so here is a little bit of additional advice to help facilitate a smooth design process. Start thinking about how your product will be sterilized soon. This will allow for advanced planning and designing of the packaging. I have seen this become a problem over and over in the industry. Typically, newcomers come to, comers come to a medical device realm um, with design needs, tests, and ready to bring their product to market. They consider packaging somewhat of an afterthought and assume that it will be a quick and easy process. Unfortunately, nothing could be further from the truth. Even with accelerated aging, the packaging process can take many months to complete, and if this is if everything goes smoothly. If a packaging design fails, a redesign will have to be done, further extending the process of design, evaluation, and testing. What was months could extend potentially into years, and this could be a huge point of pain and contention uh, when the time comes when the need to go to market is very, very important. So keeping this in mind, always plan for contingencies and surprises. Rarely does a design, be it for the product or the package, happen uh, correctly and smoothly the very first cycle through. Testing almost always reveals problems that need to be addressed. Each time something critical is observed, the design cycle has to begin again. So keep this in mind and ensure that you design your product and packaging somewhat concurrently so that market, time to market is as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you so much for your time and I really hope this webinar has been helpful for you. If you have any questions whatsoever about design, testing, or other packaging needs, please do not hesitate to contact our sales team. Uh, we do offer free 30-minute consultations and I look very much forward to spending time with you in the near future. Thank you so much. Take care.